Tinian Island was captured by the Americans in August 1944. Although it's a tiny island, just 38 square miles, a speck in the huge blue expanse of the Pacific, it was invaluable as it gave the Americans another excellent base from which to bomb Japan. Within months of its capture, Tinian had become the world's biggest and busiest airfield, with four main runways each a mile and a half long. And it was from Tinian that America launched its two nuclear attacks on Japan. But just three years after the war, the New York Times was reporting that Tinian was overgrown, choked with vines, its airstrips cracked and deserted, and the huge concrete pits where the atom bombs had been loaded onto the B-29s are, quote, water-filled and resound with the croaking of toads. And so what do you do with a place like Tinian when the war is over? Well, the newspaper were reporting plans to turn it into a leper colony. But let's go back to Tinian in August 1945, as America prepared its second atomic bombing, the attack on Nagasaki. Hiroshima had been bombed on the 6th of August, and the American military were keen to drop another atomic bomb quickly. They had to do it fast, the argument went, to give the impression that there were rows and rows of atomic bombs just lining up, waiting to be dropped, city after city after city. Of course, there were no more. Trinity had been the world's first, exploded of course in the desert in a nuclear test, And within hours of its successful birth out there on the sand, the Indianapolis set sail for Tinian with Little Boy, ready for Hiroshima. Now they were keen to go again, this time with a bomb nicknamed Fat Man. And they had to do it fast, to keep up momentum and pressure, yes, but to create the impression that there were loads of these nuclear monsters just raring to go. Of course, there were others in the military who were unpleasantly surprised that Hiroshima hadn't been enough to force a surrender. General Marshall himself said, What we did not take into account was that the destruction would be so complete that it would be an appreciable time before the actual facts of the case would get to Tokyo. The destruction of Hiroshima was so complete that there was no communication for at least a day. Basically, they had done their job too well, I suppose. And so, the day after Hiroshima, when no immediate surrender had appeared, the American military drafted leaflets to be dropped over 47 Japanese cities. These leaflets would describe the atomic bomb and give warning of its terrible power and asked the Japanese people to petition the emperor to end the war. Six million of these leaflets were printed, so it was a huge operation. So huge that the historian Richard Rhodes tells us that Nagasaki did not receive her leaflets until the day after she was bombed. As these leaflets were being drafted and edited and printed and dropped, preparations for Fat Man went ahead. 
on the island of Tinian, it was loaded onto a silver plate B-29 bomber. Silver plate being the name for those bombers which had been specially modified to carry atomic bombs. Hiroshima, of course, had been bombed by the silver plate Enola Gay, and now the honour went to a plane called Boxcar. The name being a pun on a boxcar and the captain's name, Frederick Bock. Although, for the Nagasaki mission, the plane would not be flown by Captain Bock. Instead, he and the captain of the Great Artiste swapped planes. This was because the Great Artiste had taken part in the Hiroshima bombing as the plane which would gather measurements and data and so had been kitted out with all the required instrumentation. She was supposed to have been the plane which dropped the next atomic bomb. But because the next one happened so swiftly, there wasn't time to uninstall all the instruments. So the planes simply swapped the crew. The captain of the Great Artiste would still get the honour of bombing Nagasaki, but he would do it in a different plane. So the crew of the Great Artiste went into Boxcar, and the Boxcar men went into the Great Artiste, which, as it did with Hiroshima, would do all the measuring. They would also be accompanied on their mission by a third plane, the Big Stink, who would do photography. Boxcar, carrying the bomb, would be flown by Major Charles Sweeney and his bombardier, the man in charge of getting the bomb on target, would be the legendary Captain Kermit Behan. It is said that the great artiste, being Behan's normal plane, had been named in honour of his skill with bombs and with the ladies. So that was the trio ready for the second nuclear mission. Boxcar, the Great Artiste, and the Big Stink. But before Boxcar could take off from Tinian, a problem was discovered with her fuel. The fuel pump for one of the 600-gallon tanks had gone wrong, meaning the plane would need to fly with a heavy and useless 600-gallon tank, which would be feeding nothing to the engines. Sure, they could stay on the ground and have it fixed, but it would take a while. And we know that no one was fond of waiting in this scenario. So Major Sweeney made the decision to just go, go, go. To hell with it, he said. But flying with this dud fuel pump did mean that they would have to be very careful with their fuel. They would have very little to spare. And they would be carrying a lot more weight than the Enola Gay had a few days before. Because Fat Man, as the name suggests was much heavier than Little Boy, 1,300 pounds heavier. There was also the fact that Boxcar would have to fly at high altitude to dodge the forecast storms. With all of these demands on her, fuel would be precious. But the decision was made. No point moaning about it. Boxcar was going. As she barreled down the runway at Tinian, People watching her might have held their breath because Fat Man, now snug in the plane's bomb bay, was armed. It had a more complex mechanism than Little Boy, who had been armed in the air. But Big Old Fat Man was so complex that it had to be armed on the ground at Tinian and then loaded into the plane. So there must have been a few sighs of relief on Tinian when she safely took off and vanished into the clouds. But there was no such relaxation for the crew on Boxcar when, three hours into the flight, a red light pinged on, indicating that the bomb's fuse monitor was alert. Yep, that red light meant that some of the bomb's fuses had been activated. The problem was fixed with relative ease by Boxcar's weaponeer, but it was enough to make Major Sweeney say, To have come this far and end in a vaporising flash? My only response was to whisper, 
Oh Lord. Now the trio of planes weren't flying directly to their target. Instead, they had to reach a rendezvous point, which was Yakashima Island. Here, the planes would circle and meet up with one another. Boxcar got to the rendezvous point, as did the great artiste. But there was no sign of the big stink. Boxcar and the great artiste circled and circled. They waited and waited for 50 minutes. But big stink didn't show. Paul Ham, in his book Hiroshima Nagasaki, tells us that the Big Stink was there, but had simply flown too high and lost contact with Boxcar. Despite strict orders not to hang around at the rendezvous point, and despite the fuel constraints, Boxcar did wait, circled and waited, but then had no choice but to go onwards without the Big Stink. Onwards then to the primary target, Kokura. Kokura had been chosen as the primary target, as it held Japan's biggest arsenal. And Nagasaki was next on the list, as she had the Mitsubishi shipyards. And this was where the torpedoes used in Pearl Harbor had been built. So Boxcar flew on towards the Japanese mainland, towards Kokura, accompanied by the great artiste with all her measuring equipment. On board the latter plane was a New York Times journalist, William L. Lawrence, who described the mission. Unfortunately, he describes it in very purple prose. I'll read you an extract here. I noticed a strange, eerie light coming through the window high above the navigator's cabin, and as I peered through the dark all around us, I saw a startling phenomenon. The whirling giant propellers had somehow became great luminous disks of blue flame. The same luminous blue flame appeared on the plexiglass windows in the nose of the ship and on the tips of the giant wings. It looked as though we were riding the whirlwind through space on a chariot of blue fire. It was, I surmised, a surcharge of static electricity that had accumulated on the tips of the propellers and on the dielectric material in the plastic windows. One's thoughts dwelt anxiously on the precious cargo in the invisible ship ahead of us. Was there any likelihood of danger that this heavy electric tension in the atmosphere might set it off? I expressed my fears to Captain Bock who seems nonchalant and imperturbed at the controls. He quickly reassures me, it's a familiar phenomenon seen often on ships. I've seen it many times on bombing missions. It's known as St Elmo's Fire. On we went through the night. We soon rode out the storm and our ship was once again sailing on a smooth course, straight ahead on a direct line to the Empire. He's then invited uh, up to the nose of the ship, which of course was transparent on the B-29s, so that you could see down to your target. He says, At that height, the vast ocean below and the sky above seemed to merge into one great sphere. I was on the inside of that firmament, riding above the giant mountains of white cumulus clouds, letting myself be suspended in infinite space. One hears the whirl of the motors behind one, but it soon becomes insignificant against the immensity all around. There comes a point where space also swallows time, and one lives through eternal moments filled with an oppressive loneliness, as though all life had suddenly vanished from the earth, and you're the only one left, a lone survivor travelling endlessly through interplanetary space. Weather reports from earlier reconnaissance planes had indicated that the view over Kokura was nice and clear. 
Interestingly, the plane which surveyed Kokura and delivered the weather report was the Enola Gay, who had, of course, bombed Hiroshima just a few days before. It was crucial that the view over the target city should be clear, because Major Sweeney's superiors had insisted the bomb be dropped following a visual identification of the target. Bombing by radar would not be good enough, they wanted visual ID. So the view down onto the city had to be good. And Enola Gay delivered a report saying, it's clear, go ahead. But Boxcar had been delayed so long by waiting for the big stink over the rendezvous point that by the time she arrived over Kakura, the weather report was redundant. The city was covered in cloud. There was also a lot of smoke drifting in from last night's bombing of nearby Yawata. But Boxcar tried to do as it was bid. They flew over Kakura and tried to make a visual ID of their target, which was the city's arsenal. They came in over the city and the plane opened its bomb bay doors and the bombardier, Kermit Behan, desperately tried to spot something through the clouds but they could see nothing. Boxcar circled and tried again, making a second pass over Kakura. Doors open, ready to go. Again, nothing could be seen through the haze. And now... Boxcar was starting to attract attention from the ground and was being fired at by Japanese defences. They made a third attempt, flying back in over Kakura, doors open. Nothing could be seen. Boxcar gave up and headed southeast. What an escape for Kokura, what luck! The B-29 had flown over the city three times, Bombay doors wide open, fat man leering down on them. And yet they were spared. They came so close to nuclear destruction that people on the ground reported hearing Boxcar droning above the clouds, straining and searching for them. One Kokura resident was a young boy at the time, 14 years old, Kenji Yoshio. And he had gotten into a disagreement with fellow co-workers at the railways and so was given the punishment job of going outside and scanning the skies, looking for the flash that would mean nuclear attack. His only protection for this irrational and useless task was that he was dressed in all white clothing. He's quoted in the New York Times as saying, If I saw the flash, I was supposed to run off and warn everyone to get in the shelter. He went on, I clearly remember the sky that day. Sometimes when I look up now and see some clouds, I think it's the same as August 9th. It was a light grey, thick cloud, but not a rain cloud. From the ground, I could see blue sky in places. Perhaps he could see the sky, but those in the sky couldn't see him and couldn't see the target on the ground. So Kokura survived. Aware of his fuel constraints, Major Sweeney gave up on the city and flew southeast onwards to the secondary target, Nagasaki. I hope you enjoyed this episode. We will look, of course, at the bombing of Nagasaki itself next Monday. And let me say thank you and welcome to four new patrons. Four new uh, new people were kind enough to join my Patreon this week. That's Andre Russell, Millie Besso, Will Forrest and Brian Garland. So thank you to every one of you for joining and supporting the podcast. 
If you've enjoyed this episode and you want to support the podcast, you can join my Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Atomic Hobo and you can donate some money each month to the podcast. And remember, you can find me on Twitter at Julie A. McDowell or on Facebook as Nuclear Britain or on my website at juliemcdowell.com. And I'll be back next Monday and we will look at what happened when Boxcar flew in over Nagasaki. <laughs>